Did I mention it's one of those days? <laughs> I want to say a quick thank you to Trayton Winsloff helping us out in the sound booth. Our, our regular, we have uh, two different couples, uh, two teams that take turns in the sound booth, Dan and Emily, and they're both sick today. Found that out yesterday. Michael and Kevin do the other weeks. Found out today that they're both sick. So, quick text this morning, and uh, Trayton came in. Thank you for helping out with that, Trayton. Um, we appreciate you filling in back there. And uh, thanks to Caleb and Lila for helping switch the screens so that we can follow along, hopefully, with today's message, maybe a little bit easier. And uh, hopefully you grabbed teaching notes on your way in. And uh, also, hopefully, you grabbed a uh, communion set, uh, prepackaged elements for later on. It is the first Sunday of the month, and we like to remember and celebrate what Christ has done for us as a body of believers together. And so we will partake of communion at the end of the message. And so if you want to go ahead and grab those, if you haven't already, here in person. And if you're at home, Feel free to go ahead and grab some grape juice if you have some on hand and a cracker. Um, the Lord will bless that. It's the heart that matters. And uh, in love for you to be able to join us in that as well. Today, we're going to start something that I've never done as your senior pastor. I've never taken a gospel and walked through one of the gospels. We've, we've done one of the letters uh, in the New Testament, a smaller letter and, and taken four or five chapters or whatever and, and looked at that. We've taken a couple different Old Testament books, usually ones that are kind of smaller and we can do in about six weeks, no longer than eight weeks or something like that. I've never taken one of the Gospels. But I felt like God was directing me this direction and like, okay, we're going to jump in and we'll start it. Christmas, and we'll uh, use the book of John and go through, and Lord willing, things will line up pretty close. By the time we get to Easter, we'll be in the book of John at that time. And so we'll look at Christmas from the book of John, and then we'll go through the rest of the book of John, and hopefully, Lord willing, things will line up and we'll be pretty close to uh, talking about his death and resurrection come Easter time. The book of John is, is an amazing book. One of the gospels, gospel accounts. So it's telling the story of Jesus. Gospel, by the way, just so we all are clear, gospel simply means good news. And there is great news that the, uh, that the writer of John has for us. And just if you want to have a little bit of a background, the writer of John, the book of John, is written by John. How many of you got that one? Like, I knew that one. <laughs> like, I didn't even study for the test, and I could get that one right. Okay, you can't always do that. Like, the book of Titus wasn't written by Titus. Okay, but, but John was written by John. It gets a little bit more tricky because there are different Johns that are mentioned in the Bible. In fact, in today's passage, in John chapter 1, which I invite you to go ahead and turn there if you haven't already, John chapter 1, it's page 750, I believe, in one of the KWC Bibles, if you want to grab that. In the book of John, John's going to talk about another John, John the Baptist. And I think sometimes we think, well, John the Baptist wrote the book of John, but John the Baptist didn't write the book of John. And we'll see as we go through the book of John pretty f clearly that John the Baptist couldn't have written the book of John. Most scholars believe that John was the last of the gospel accounts to be written. And it, many would suggest that the others, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had been written. John knew about them. John had wrote, read them and, and everything. And so basically when John went to write his gospel account as an older man, and most believe that John was at the age where he was an elderly statesman, where the rest of the disciples had already been 
put to death most of them, if not all of them, for their faith. And John is left as the last apostle that had walked with Jesus and writes these words, filling in the blanks in some ways of what, what's known as the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what they maybe kind of had left out, a different perspective than what Matthew, Mark, or Luke provided. And the beauty of it, just a quick side note, the beauty of it is that God provided all four of these, okay? They're all four inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're all in the inerrant word of God. They all speak to our hearts. And God had a purpose for each gospel account. Each one wrote in a way that would connect with their audience in a different way than what the other authors would. And in some instances, would better connect with some audiences than others would. Like Matthew will specifically connect better with those that are Jews than the other three. But the book of John is, is a great book. John, as one of the disciples, he wasn't just one of the 12, he was one of the three. He was part of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. So with his brother James and with Peter, Jesus would often pull them aside. And so John is given even a greater look or a deeper look into who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about as he was on this earth. And we see that in the book of John. And so the three things that mark the book of John in my mind is one, it's, it's very personal. We see that John had a, a firsthand account of what was going on in Jesus' life and ministry. And that will come through clearly as we read through the book of John, that it's very personal. John had high affection and high admiration for Jesus. I don't think you can find anybody that loved Jesus more than John loved Jesus. And I don't think you can find anybody that had a higher opinion of who Jesus was and is than John. John was very personal. His writing is very personal. It's also profound. There are truths that are in the book of John that are just simply profound. They are deep, deep truths. They are the, the bedrock of our understanding of who God is and who Jesus is. The foundation for our most sacred doctrinal beliefs. The things that we say, this is what makes us who we are. This is what we believe. We see in the book of John. The third thing that separates the book of John in some regards is how practical it is. In many ways, John is a one-size-fits-all book. Um, St. Augustine said of the book of John that an elephant could swim in it and a child not drown. It's that deep, yet that approachable, that understandable. Kind of putting things on the bottom shelf, if you will, where they're easy for anyone to access. And so I look at it and say, no matter if you are new to Christ or maybe don't even know Christ, I believe the book of John will speak immensely to you. It will encourage you. It will challenge you. It will inform you. It will instruct you. It's extremely practical. And if you've been walking with Jesus before gas was over a dollar a gallon, which means you've been walking with Jesus for a while, the book of John still has something for you as well. It will instruct, inform, and challenge you as well. Before we read the first 14 verses, I want you to know this. The Word is Jesus. The Word is Jesus. The Word is what? Jesus. Jesus. You need to know the Word is Jesus. Now let's get into the word and learn 
about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word is? The Word is? Jesus. He is the Word, and the Word is? Jesus. He was, in the beginning was Jesus, and the Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Verse 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. Him is The Word, and the Word is Jesus, just so we're all on the same page. Now, I'm going to pause here before we get into verse 6, because in these first five verses, what John has done, as the Holy Spirit is leading him, is John has provided a connection in John chapter 1, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, which, by the way, Tom's Sunday school class happened to start on today. Were they behind or are they right on time? Because God's timing is perfect, right? I mean, I couldn't have planned this any better. John John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. How does Genesis chapter 1 start? In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning is Jesus. In the beginning, God. And as you follow along, there's like a parallel that takes place. John chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1. John is introducing Jesus. And he wants us to understand who Jesus is. And as he's talking about Jesus, he he starts using some different words. And he, he uses this word life, which we'll see a lot in the book of John. And he talks about this word light, which we will see a lot in the book of John. And both of those words, life and light, are found quite a bit in Genesis chapter 1. Tom's Sunday school class knows that because they just read through Genesis chapter 1 and part of chapter 2 and and saw how there's quite a few times where life is mentioned and light is is mentioned. And I think we understand the importance of life, right? What about the importance of light? Do we understand that importance? Well, let me just tell you, I was reminded of light's importance last night. I was doing a little bit of work here, and I turned lights off, and I was going home to go grab a bite to eat, and it was dark. And I was in the lobby, and the stand that holds the bulletins It got wiped out last night. I took it out better than I think any of the Michigan defenders took out any of the Iowa players last night. And I didn't get to watch the game, but they must have done pretty good because they kept Iowa to three points. But I took out that stand. It's got some new screws in it, or Titan screws anyway, last night because the lights weren't on. I didn't see it, and I just plowed right into it. Light is important, and we see light gives three different things. It, it illuminates, it exposes sin. It helps us to see what the darkness hides. And John will talk about that more as he goes through his writing. Light also helps to grow. My wife and daughter enjoy keeping houseplants, and I know some of you do as well, and some of you have even uh, given them plants, or, or maybe they've even given you some plants or, or whatever, but we see the importance of having light to be able to grow. But we also see that light illuminates, as I found out last night, or reminded of last night, I should say, that light illuminates our path. The scripture says that God's word is a light unto our path, right? And we're going to see how Jesus provides all of that. But why did John use the word word? The word is Jesus, but why, why, didn't, why didn't John just say in the beginning was Jesus? 
Seems like that would have been simpler. But John, I believe, was making a connection, and, and not just making one connection, I believe he was making two or three different connections to those that were reading then and even reading now for us to understand the depth of who Jesus is. But I believe one of those was the connection back to Genesis chapter 1. Because again, in the beginning was the Word, and we see this, this parallel between John chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 1. And as we read through Genesis chapter 1 in Tom's Sunday school class, maybe some of you noticed, in fact, at least one of you would have noticed, because the way Tom had it broken up, different people read different sections. And so somebody read like in chapter 1, verse 3 of Genesis, and God said, and then verse 6, and God said, and then verse 9, and God said, and then verse 11, and God said, and then verse 14, and God said, and then verse 20, and God said, and then verse 24, and God said, and then verse 26, then God said. Why? Because there's something about the spoken word. The Jews believed in the power of the spoken word. It's written about in Proverbs and Psalms. Power of life and death is held in the tongue, the word. So I believe John was making connection, Jesus going back to creation, the spoken word, the power of God at work. I believe also that there was a connection, another connection, because John is writing in Greek. He's not writing in Hebrew, the language of the common language of the Jews. He's writing in Greek. Most of the New Testament was written in Greek because that was the common language of the day. And as John is writing, he's writing with the understanding that there was a great philosopher that was uh, around in 580 or 560 BC, Her- Heraclitus, I think is his name. I don't know, and I don't think he cares if I pr- mispronounce it. But he famously suggested that you never step in the same river twice. I don't know if you've ever heard that saying, but you never step in the same river twice. Why is that? Because as soon as you step in and then you step out, when you step back in, the water has shifted. And so you're stepping into another body of water than what you had stepped in before. That's pretty deep, right? And as he looked at creation, he looked at the world around him, and he started making notes and figuring things out. And like, there's, there's a rhyme and a reason. There's... It's not just chaos. There's something going on. There's 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 a plan, there's a purpose to all of this. And he used a Greek word called logos to illustrate that. And the word that John uses in John chapter one, when he says, In the beginning was the word, he says, In the beginning was Logos. And so we see very quickly that I think John is helping us to understand that without Jesus, there is no purpose. Jesus is the one that provides the plan, the purpose. We see that John is connecting Jesus, the Word, to the spoken Word of God in creation. We also understand that Logos was used to basically be the word that would describe the the bridge between created and the creator. The the one that helped us to understand who God was. The intermediate agency by which God created material things and communicated with them. In other words, sort of a bridge. And as we go through the book of John, we're going to see that there is no life nor light, nor purpose, nor power without the Word of God. And the Word is Jesus. John's now going to introduce us to another John. John chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. 
Believe that I have underlined here. Believe is a word that I want you to just know is really important to John. John's going to use the word believe or a derivative thereof over 100 times throughout his book. It's that important. He wants us to believe in Jesus. In fact, in John, he writes that, that basically, he, I've written all these things so that you may believe in the Son of God and that you may have life in his name. Like, this is why. So that you would believe. John the Baptist lived so that people would believe in Jesus. He pointed to Jesus. John the disciple, John the apostle, John the writer of the gospel according to John, writes back looking at Jesus' life so that we would believe in Jesus. They're both witnesses, one pointing forward to Jesus, the other one pointing back to Jesus. But the big idea is that we would believe and then he continues, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Him is he, and he is the light, or the true light, and the true light is the word, and the word is Jesus. And Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the good news. Jesus is the word. The word is Jesus, and Jesus is the word, and the word is good. But there's bad news here. He came to the world. Merry Christmas. But the world said, no, thank you. They did not recognize him. They didn't accept him. They didn't see him for who he is. And they rejected him. But John doesn't stop there. There's, there is good news. Yet, or nonetheless, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Good news right there, amen? Verse 14. The Word, and the Word is Jesus. The Word became flesh, Merry Christmas, and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Son of God is the Word of God. And the word is Jesus. We're going to talk more about verse 14 and its implications for us. It's amazing truth next week. And pick it up with verse 14 and carry on a little bit. What I want to give you quickly is three things that John wants us to know and embrace about Jesus this Christmas season. Three things. Number one, Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John makes it very clear right from the introduction. He just jumps right in. The most important thing that you need to know, and somebody, I've, I've heard a variety of different people say this, so I don't even know who to attribute it uh, to. It too, but the most important thing about you is what you believe about Jesus, and that's that's great to keep in mind. The most important thing about you is what you believe about Jesus, and John wants you to believe and to know to trust that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Foundational truth to Christianity. It's what separates Christianity from every other religion. Is we see Jesus and understand and know that Jesus is God. We'll say, well, did Jesus ever claim to be God? He absolutely did. And his word is clear, God's word is clear that the word is is Jesus, and Jesus 
is God. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's important that we understand that Jesus never had a beginning, and he'll have no end. Jesus is God. He's eternal. You see, but everybody else approaches Jesus. And we put two things, Scripture separates things into two categories. There's creator and there's created. Creator, created. And everybody else puts Jesus in the created category. If you look at the the different religions or cults, if you will, Mormons teach that Jesus became a God with a little g, and that humans can become a God with a little g. We just basically follow Jesus' footsteps, and then you too can become a God with a little g. They, They don't teach, they don't preach, they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. John doesn't say that the Word became God. He says Jesus was God. He says the Word was God. Muslims, they believe Jesus was a prophet. Jehovah's Witness, they believe Jesus is an angel. In fact, they believe Jesus is uh, a form of Michael the archangel. That's why they're a cult. They're not a Christian denomination because they get it wrong with Jesus. And if you get it wrong with Jesus, you got it wrong. Hindus. Believe that Jesus was a man who became enlightened. There are a lot of people that believe Jesus was a good man. But if you don't believe that Jesus is God, you're wrong. And the most important thing about you is what you believe about Jesus. John is clear the word is Jesus, and Jesus is God. Let me try to illustrate this truth if I can get my computer stuff to work right. I forgot my pencil, so I'm using my finger, which is even worse than my pencil. But if you would, go ahead and on your paper, put God, put a circle around it. And you might make your circle a little bit bigger And you write some different words that describe who God is. Like, let me give you a few examples. Go ahead and write creator. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. Go ahead and write eternal. No beginning, no end. Go ahead and you can write omniscient if you know how to spell it (laughs) or you can get close enough to it. Knows all. Or if you just want to simplify it, if if it will help you, draw a question mark with a circle around it and put a line through it. God has no questions. He knows it all. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent, a church word that we use. If you want, you could just write the greater than symbol with a crown next to it. The king of kings is greater than. He's sovereign. He's over all. He's more powerful. He's omnipresent. He's not limited by time and space. God. He's holy. All of these attributes of God. Then if you would draw a triangle. Scripture gives us the idea that there is what we call the Trinity. Trinity is not a word that is found in Scripture. 
but it's our understanding. It's a word that we use to describe what Scripture describes. The Bible teaches that there is one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of whom are God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. In John chapter 1, John clearly tells us about the Father and the Son, God. Holy Spirit's not mentioned in chapter 1, but the Holy Spirit will be mentioned later in the book of John. Jesus isn't mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, but the Holy Spirit is mentioned. It says, And the Spirit of God hovered over them, right at the beginning of Genesis chapter 1. We see God speak, which later in, John chapter, in Genesis chapter 1, and then in John chapter 1, we understand that to be the Word, Jesus. And we see the Holy Spirit clearly father son holy spirit the trinity one god three persons the father is god the son is god the holy spirit is god it's also important that we understand that the father is not the holy spirit the father is not the son The Son is not the Father, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. They're distinct. We see that in John chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God. So we see right there in John chapter one that John is saying that the Son, the Word, Jesus, is God. But the Son and the Father are not exactly the same. There is distinction between the two. They are the same in essence, the same in character. But there is a distinction. We see throughout Scripture that through the Trinity, they have different roles that they provide and different ways that they interact with humanity. But keep in mind, one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Second thing John wants us to know about Jesus, that Jesus is life. Jesus is life. He says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. As we continue through the book of John, John's going to continue to hammer this home. Jesus is life. Know Jesus, know life. If you know Jesus, you'll know life. You might be alive, but without Jesus, you're not living. In John... We're going to see that in Jesus we experience the the breadth of life. And in Jesus there's a whole different depth of life. In John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. The son is the word and the word is Jesus. Gave his only son that whoever believes in him, again the word believes, should not die, but have what? Eternal life, everlasting life. The breath of it, that in Jesus we, we see the breath of life, that life doesn't end here. Again, we go back to the hope of Christmas, the advent, not just his first coming, but his second coming, and the peace that we have, not just with his first coming, but his second coming. The breadth 
of life that Jesus gives us. But John's also going to help us to see the depth of life that Jesus gives us. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says these words, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full or have it more abundantly. That there's not just a breath to life that Jesus gives us, not just eternal life that Jesus offers, but that there's a whole different kind of living now that Jesus offers and provides. We see in John that Jesus was born so that you and I could be reborn. That we could experience a new life, a real life. Because Jesus is life. The final thing that John wants us to know about Jesus in this passage is that Jesus makes it possible to have a relationship with God. We see this in this idea of being born again, being reborn. And John's going to pick up on that in a couple chapters and talk about somebody that had a discussion with Jesus about being reborn. But in John, as we just looked in John chapter 1, verse 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. John makes it very clear. Uh, this isn't something we could do on our own. Uh, our DNA doesn't get us to God. I'm thankful for the heritage that I have. Thankful. Thankful for the men and women that have gone before me, that have known the Lord, that have walked with the Lord, that served the Lord. A rich history of those that served God in Africa. And I am extremely thankful for that and, and praise God for that. But that doesn't get me into heaven. I'm certainly not rich enough to buy my way into heaven, but neither, neither are you. Ne neither is Bill Gates or Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Oprah Winfrey or anybody else. I'm sure in the world can't behave myself into heaven. Scripture is pretty clear about that. Neither can you. We needed a bridge. We needed the word. We needed Jesus. And Jesus makes it possible to have a relationship with God. John would later write in 1 John, because John just was so amazed by Jesus' love, just taken back by Jesus' love, and the fact that because Jesus loved him, because Jesus had died for him, because he had believed in who Jesus was and who Jesus is. Oh, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Oh, it takes us back to the songs that we started with. Oh, the wonder. Like, man, this is awesome. Like, I can't even hardly grasp this. Like, you would love me that you would make it possible to have a relationship that I can, I can talk to you. I can experience you. I can know that I can live with you forever. John wants us to know Jesus makes that possible. And so he's going to tell us how. Right now he's just basically setting the stage. These are the themes Jesus is God. Jesus is life. And Jesus makes it possible to have a relationship with God. I invite you to grab your communion elements at this time. And if you would, you can go ahead and pull back the first seal